Hey everybody. Today we're going to be talking about data security and storage hardening in Rook and Ceph. I'm Sage McTaggart. I work on cybersecurity at IBM. I did my undergrad at UMass Amherst, graduate school at UC Santa Cruz. I've done research in a variety of areas ranging from programming languages, file systems, and I've done security for Ceph at Red Hat and now at IBM. I do everything from incident response to working on secure architecture for our storage systems. In my free time, I like to hike with my dog, Aurora, and work towards a more inclusive world. Hello. Um, my name is Federico Lucifredi. I'm the product management director for the Ceph platform at Red Hat and IBM. As you can see, I was caught up in a bit of traffic. <laughs> Bunch of things that I've done are over there. Um, basically all open source with rare exceptions. The reason why you see me there with the cloud is that I wrote the AWS book for O'Reilly. And uh, yeah, I think that's enough about me. So, Ceph is the dominant software defined storage solution in open source. We like to think of Ceph as the future of storage and we're quite proud of the community that we've built around it and its technical prowess. Ceph is highly scalable, horizontally scalable, highly available, highly resilient, capable of serving file, block, and object from a single cluster. And that is why there are about, uh, as of last estimate, six and a half exabytes of Ceph out there. Many other things can be said about Ceph, but in short, it's the bee's knees. But you're um, hopefully already aware of that since you're here. So let's think of it as the Linux kernel of storage for now. Less famous but equally awesome is Rook. Uh, Rook helps reduce the operational burden a storage team faces by delivering cloud native storage for Kubernetes and uh, by largely automating the behavior of the storage on a Kubernetes cluster. It's an operator in the terminology that Red Hat favors. Creating horizontally scaled and self-healing clusters in Ceph is complemented by Rook making them increasingly self-managing. And even self-scaling, if you will. Rook, Rook enables Ceph to deploy with and on Kubernetes with ease, enabling all the benefits of container orchestration on what is now the dominant private cloud platform. Storage on, running on top of the compute infrastructure like any other workload would. This runs as an overlay on top of Kubernetes. Or an alternative, running on bare metal externally to, um, uh, to the Kubernetes cluster. And this is preferred for petabyte scale storage where obviously running on top of Kubernetes is a little bit uh, impractical in terms of cost. Um, uh, we can also serve multiple Kubernetes clusters out of a single Ceph cluster, which is another common reason to have external clusters. If you have a fleet of Kubernetes clusters, you want them all consuming ideally one or two Ceph clusters so that you have less um, management burden for the storage. Rook is the storage operator. So that sets the stage for uh, where we are today. Um, one thing I wanted to share uh, in the slide, uh, this one we created internally um, to explain to IBM's leadership what Ceph is all about. <laughs> and it's a little bit of history of Ceph, so it's kind of cute in terms of various landmarks. The bit that is interesting is what I have there in the corner, the February estimate of deployed um, capacity, we believe that there are about six and a half exabytes of Ceph out there right now, which makes it, um, makes it, um, I don't know if it makes it the largest software defined storage, but it certainly makes it the largest software defined open source storage. Security practices, let's go to the meat of the talk here. So, Security practices harden a specific point of the infrastructure. As with pretty much everything security-wise, cherry picking without a model of the threat and the attackers is not a viable strategy. So the usual, and the joke usually goes, if you want 
to protect from all possible threats. You need to turn off the computer, pour it in concrete, and throw it at the bottom of the ocean. So uh, what you can do is define what kind of threats are you facing and how to protect against those while still maintaining the technology usable. Are you facing script kiddies or the GRU or the dreaded privilege insider? These are very different models, different scenarios, different responses. Uh, some of these want to steal your data, other wants to crypto lock your data and hold you for ransom. Others may be just satisfied with disrupting your operations or causing a transient denial of service. You need to define the threats so that you can protect against those. And yes, there, are, there is the theory, just protect against everything, that is not real. Like in anything management-wise, you need to prioritize because if you decide that you're going to do everything, then nothing is a priority. You have to pick your battles. So let's dive right in on how this works. Uh, the public security zone, uh, let's start from the network. The public security zone is an entirely untrusted area of the cloud. Could be the internet as a whole or just networks external to your cluster that you have no authority over. Data transmissions crossing this zone should make use of encryption. Note that the public zone, as I just defined it, does not include the storage cluster front end, which in Ceph is called public underscore network, which is a different thing, and defines the storage front end and properly belongs in the storage access zone. <clears throat> the Ceph client zone refers to networking access and uh, networks as accessing Ceph clients like the object gateway, uh, the Ceph file system, or block storage. Ceph clients are not always excluded from the public security zone. For instance, it's possible to expose the object gateways as three interface in the public security zone. That's quite common. Uh, next, the storage access zone is instead an internal network providing Ceph clients with access to the storage cluster itself. Finally, the cluster zone refers to the most internal network, providing storage nodes with connectivity for replication, heartbeat, backfill, and recovery tasks. This zone includes the Ceph cluster's backend network, called the Ceph underscore network in Ceph. Operators often run clear text traffic in this zone to avoid uh, encryption overhead. And again, the choice here depends on your threat model. If you are afraid of privileged insiders, or if you have a regulatory mandate that says encrypt everything, you're going to be encrypting these. If instead you're trying to optimize a, net, uh, a cluster for absolute performance, and these networks are physically separated and there is no way anyone can get the keys to the rack and go tap the network physically, then not encrypting it is okay. So again, the threat model is king. Now, all of these zones are separately mapped and combined depending on the specific um, architecture that you're deploying and uh, the threat model that you have in use. Uh, so, components spanning the boundary of two security zones um, are usually Ceph daemons, and um, they need to be configured with the trust requirements of the most secure of the two, obviously. These are also natural attack points for uh, an attacker that may be trying to escalate privilege by crossing from one zone to the other. Because obviously the demons have a foothold in both zones, so if you could exploit it, you could cross over there. Um, the most obvious part to secure here is, um, is uh, security controls. So um, misconfigured security controls here would be bad. You want to have things set up correctly from the start. And then, obviously, there is the possibility of exploits, but I think we have a pretty good record of not having too many of those. Not in this class, anyway. Operators should consider exceeding zone requirements and integration points, which for a storage product is often easier to accomplish than for, let's say, a compute product like a general purpose operating system. For example, the cluster security zone can be isolated from other zones easily because there is no reason for it to connect to other zones. Conversely, an object gateway in the client security zone will need to access the cluster security zone's monitors, 
uh, on port 6789. All the OSDs on port 6800s through however many you have and will likely expose its S3 API to the public um, in the public security zone in ports 80 and 443. So we have all varieties in terms of the access required by our demons. This is probably the one that has the widest span. Um, but we do not need to apply the most permissive policy to everything. That's the point. And I think it's your turn. Oops. So now we're going to talk a little bit about product security for Ceph. We're going to talk about moving companies as an open source product. Working within a large company has brought pros and cons. It's made us aware of the need for support for open source products and what that looks like. You can always write your own forks and maintain and patch them and yeah, this can become your weekend hobby. <laughs> but how do we support a product within a corporate environment? Red Hat's the classic example, and we've moved to IBM. It's definitely brought some changes. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about IBM product security, how our move to IBM has gone, our accomplishments, and future plans. So for all of us Red Hatters, we miss you, but Big Blue has mostly been pretty good for us. It's definitely brought some benefits and improvements. So at IBM, we continue to follow a secure development and lifecycle policy. It's pretty similar to Red Hat in terms of what the process looks like, but it has the additional goal of fixing all CVEs. We also do more formal pen tests and threat models, and we improve them every year. Lots of new exciting things have come with this collaboration, and one of our not-so-secret goals is to spread open source within industry. Part of this relates to how we're finding and fixing vulnerabilities in, uh, in upstream stuff, and we're working with open source teams to fix these vulnerabilities. Additionally, th this has been true for a while now, but we're fully onboarded with IBM PCERT. This meant automating a lot of different scans of our code using uh, different scanners. They also scan our dependencies. We're manifesting and documenting all dependencies. We've found customers want clean scans sometimes including dependencies, and that can be a little bit tricky. This has sort of stemmed from President Biden's attestation executive order, and what this means is we have to automatically update dependencies. This isn't trivial, but we can start looking and seeing which ones of these have the most CVEs. Uh, for example, Grafana, they find a lot of CVEs, which is great, and they fix them, which is great but we want to automatically update Grafana to the latest minor release with every release, and we're doing this. We might say updating dependencies uh, can break builds. Yeah, that's true. That doesn't change the fact it has to happen. So we're starting from our dependencies with the most CVEs per release uh, to reduce our number of CVEs total, allowing us to fix all CVEs without creating undue work. We're still following our existing process with regular security updates. We still have Z streams. We're still working with upstream with vulnerabilities. We're implementing changes based on upstream requests even, uh, such as updating the base container more regularly or updating it to ones that are more commonly used. We're following these IBM standards of fixing all CVEs, but we're offering them to upstream. We're turning our scans into pipelines that run automatically so that I don't have to spend a day running twist lock or something, but it just runs automatically. We're automating everything that we can. This will enable us to be within IBM SLA by end of year, op optimistically. And that includes working with dependencies to ensure that they're fixed in a timely manner, reaching out to upstream communities saying, hey, what, what's your plan for fixing this? And things like that. So we're, we're continuing to follow what works, expanding our work when we need to, and working to improve what we discover. Please always feel free to reach out, talk to us about what you want Seth to be. There's definitely been challenges with any move, but there's been a lot of benefits. Finding more areas to improve is not a negative. This has actually been a very large positive for us. Some of the areas that we're still working on, we're improving dashboard architecture for more security, we're improving call home functionality, and working to improve IBM's security there. 
We're coordinating and automating IBM's open source licensing, which will then encourage them to use open source software within industry. We're expanding our use cases to things even like AI, government clients, whatever we can use stuff for a backend for, we're working on expanding our use cases. And we're doing a little bit of cryptography work that I'm gonna get into. So one particularly fruitful collaboration with IBM has been with IBM Research. We're particularly interested in confidential and quantum computing research. We're still in the very, very early stages, so we'll see how this goes, but we're documenting where we use cryptography and seeing if it makes sense to offer an option that uses open source quantum libraries to be quantum safer. We mostly use AES. That isn't always enough. So we're looking at things like open source quantum and other libraries because we really want it to all be open source. We're also in this process documenting our architecture better and seeing where, uh, where would be the best places for trusted compute modules, TCMs. This definitely affected our dashboard redesign when we were thinking about it. We were like, oh, we could plop in a TCM if we do this redesign. So with all of this, we wanna make sure that we're compliant. To that extent, we wanna see how viable things like FedRAMP, um, all these other requirements that we might have, uh, how viable is it for us to meet all of these requirements? That's part of our desire to fix all CVEs beyond just the most basic IBM requirements. We wanna make sure that we're marketing to the correct people, that we're meeting the requirements needed for our users. If we can't meet the basic requirements, who would use our product? Security has to cover all the bases and see what makes sense. So this is a little bit about how we currently do encryption and key management. Server side, operators overwhelmingly choose to encrypt data at, re at rest using Lux. All the data and metadata of a Ceph storage cluster can be secured using a variety of decrypt options. And basically all of our customers choose to. You don't have to, but pretty much everybody wants to use Lux. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we also offer FIPS 140-2 uh, ciphers with appropriate versions of RHEL as an option. We have, so we have a FIPS mode. And then we also enable a security best practice by locating our monitor daemons on separate hosts from the storage daemons, mons versus OSDs. This ensures the anti-affinity of the keys and data they encrypt so that, if a, so that the driver hosts are physically separated from its decryption keys. This is just a general security best practice, but it's something that Ceph enables by default. The object store gateway also has additional ca ca capabilities based on the OSD strategy, including encryption at ingestion time, the use of per user keys, in contrast to per drive keys. We have key rotation with tools like Vault. We have support for AWS key management and others. Uh, we support OpenStack and several other uh, KMS. And for encryption in transit, as of Messenger version 2.1 in Nautilus, we can secure network communication by turning on the Ceph protocol encryption. Typically, we would just use clear text. The networks where the Ceph uh, cluster is using the Ceph protocol are usually physically or logically isolated from access via our security zones. So not a huge issue, but if you wanna be extra secure, you can use messenger version 2.1. The main reason why people wouldn't wanna use this by default, compati backwards compatibility, overheads, Etc. But latency is shadowed by network communication if CPU overhead is accounted for in a properly designed cluster. Performance really isn't that bad if you want to use Messenger version 2.1. Now what about Rook? Rook uses custom resource definitions to, to encode many of these settings, configuring trust certificates for RGW's web server, for example. Rook supports at rest data encryption like we discussed earlier. We have in-flight Ceph protocol encryption in 1.9. Kubernetes user permission system also applies to the persistent volumes. This enables permissions, quotas, all that wonderful stuff from Kubernetes. Nothing Rook needs to do here. Rook, of course, supports uh, key management systems in the CSI driver. This enables individual volumes to be encrypted with their own key, which enables another security best practice of limiting the scope per key. We can do key rotation, revocation and limiting the scope from each key. This really limits the scope of our unencrypted traffic by limiting the scope of each key. 
So now what about the control plan? As popularized by Ansible, SSH is used by Ceph Admin, Ceph Ansible, and other deployment and day one tools to provide a secure command path for install and upgrade options as part of host management. We do this so that our dashboard isn't usually exposed to the world, and it also needs to be reachable by the operator's workstation to be of use. One of the things that we're doing in the redesign is ensuring that you also have to be authenticated to access anything with the dashboard. So we're protected, but then via all these layers with the control plane, but then we're also redesigning it so that you also have to be authenticated. Lastly, the manager supports the whole infrastructure and needs to be accessed on the storage access zone, hence why we're using SSH. So talking a little bit more about identity and access, Ceph's use of shared keys protects clusters from man-in-the-middle attacks by default. Good practices are still needed. A good practice here is to grant key ring read and write permissions only for the current user and root with client admin user restricted to root only. This prevents all users from being root, which is another security best practice. Talking a little bit about RGW, it supports the key and secret model of AWS S3 and the equivalent model for OpenStack Swift. And, you know, we still want to keep the administrator's key and secret with the appropriate respect. You still want to follow the best practice of limiting your administrative users. Uh, and the RGW user data is stored in Ceph pools, which again, we want to secure as we've discussed previously regarding data at rest. We can couple with OIDC providers such as Keycloak, backed with your organizational identity provider for an even better granular control over your roles or attribute accesses. So we have all of these that enable best practices, which makes it just so much simpler than having to implement these by hand. Um, it's also worth noting that we support LDAP and Active Directory users. We always, we, all, we always recommend secure LDAP. We also support OpenStack Keystone to authenticate object gateway users in OpenStack clouds. And now Federico is going to talk about audits. <clears throat> of course, in addition to identity management, auditing is also an important part of security. <clears throat> Operator actions against a cluster are logged and should be periodically um, reviewed and uh, the logs purged, as well as aggregated to your log management system of choice. So data retention. Um, once data is deleted from a Ceph cluster, it generally cannot be recovered for practical use. Uh, but there are exceptions. Uh, RBD has a new facility called the Trash Bin, where dynamic use of spare pool capacity can be used to retain deleted images until um, that spare capacity is needed or a certain number of days has elapsed. Similarly, in RGW, versioning of object store buckets may result in deleted, object, uh, in deleted objects being preserved in the history of the bucket. Uh, until they are purged again by policy or by the administrator. So whenever data re uh, user data retention is a concern, uh, configure your data storage pools accordingly. Additionally, individual data blocks that used to constitute an object, file, or volume are often still present on the persistent storage medium, just like with any other storage, until overwritten by use. Now, in Ceph, you cannot securely overwrite the cluster by writing a lot of data to it. It's too smart for that. It's not going to let you overwrite every single cluster in the physical storage. So that's not going to work. Secure deletion is another common question uh, of um, data retention. And the easiest way to accomplish it is um, to sanitize the media by using um, OSD encryption, which you should be using anyway for reasons we discussed previously. And so when you want to sanitize the media, what you do is you forget the key. That is very fast and presumed to be secure. Um, uh, this is also important when you're returning drives under warranty. If you are not a very big uh, buyer of hard drives, you cannot uh, degauss them or shred them or sanitize them with a shotgun. You have to return them in 
some kind of working condition, even if they are broken, so that the, um, the, uh, the vendor can verify that, um, that the drive has actually properly failed. So um, again, uh, sanitization by encryption makes sense in this scenario. Uh, then there is the opposite scenario, where uh, when you want to make it harder uh, to sanitize things, or rather when you want to make it harder for somebody that wants to uh, ransom your data to encrypt it. Um, so to make it harder to delete things or to encrypt things, you can um, prevent these kind of rogue attacks by setting to uh, factor authentication in RGW, which is the most common scenario, so that it's, it's harder to exploit that way. Then going further down the stack, um, hardening options for the operating system are hugely vendor dependent. Uh, the, these are Red Hat's choices. Um, other Ceph distributions will vary. We ship with SE Linux on by default in enforcing mode. Um, of course, you know SE Linux is sort of a religion at Red Hat. So that's hardly a surprise. Um, uh, as Sage was mentioning, we can make a use of FIPS 140 ciphers in uh, DOD configurations. Uh, right now it's FIP, FIPS 142. We're about to get FIPS 143 from the RHEL team. Um, so one can choose to do so when uh, probably when certifying a FedRAMP configuration. Um, Red Hat Ceph Storage has the listed options here for hardening our own binaries, and um, the kernel ones are obviously the ones coming from RHEL, which we bundle with, uh, with the IBM and the Red Hat products. Uh, you can obviously try out kernel supplied options like SecOmp, Pi, and several, if not all, of the ASLRs if you're building your own kernel, but again, uh, this is not, hopefully, not your um, weekend hobby. But uh, the part that is important is if you have another operating system vendor, you can um, look at these options and then look at how their kernel is compiled and see what may be applicable or what you may want uh, to turn on. Um, some resources. Um, Rani Oznat at Aquia Security has a very nice tutorial on Kubernetes secrets. Um, uh, which aren't really if you don't configure them correctly. So um, um, that is um, always mandatory reading. Uh, Hacking Kubernetes, um, latest book of Michael Hausenblast now with Andrew Martin, has a very nice chapter on storage. Um, again, Kubernetes centric. The data security and hardening guide comes from our own product. It's in both the Red Hat and IBM versions of the product and essentially is the book version of this presentation. Um, the Kubernetes documentation also has interesting material on encrypting data at rest. And um, uh, there is uh, an FAQ of um, uh, linker and uh, linker flags for GCC so that if you are fortunate enough not to know those hardening options that I was going through before, you can uh, look them up there. Um, somehow I always forget to include it. Um, the Ubuntu team, the Ubuntu security team has a very nice uh, table of all the kernel security options and you can look in there what I exists in the kernel and you can then look up what applies to your uh, to your distribution or not um, and um, I think that's about it Thanks. Really nice presentation. Thank you. Hey, Sage. Uh, quick question. For me, the most important part of what I wanted to discuss is the, like what you said about that you want to fix all vulnerabilities. Uh, can all you speak speeds. up a little louder? Ah, sorry. The most inter in interesting part for me was that related to vulnerabilities and product security. I'm a member of product security, so that's, that's the reason. Uh, I like the approach that you want to fix all vulnerabilities. <laughs> no doubt. Now the question is how? Because 
with all due respect, is Im completely impossible. <laughs> Every single day we have, you know, hundreds of new vulnerabilities reported. So it's, it's like never ending patching. So yeah. we have to accept some level that yes, it is there. We have to accept it and just move on. Especially that many of vulnerabilities are related to some components that, for example, if you take out at the component level, yes, this is a critical exploit, critical problem, no doubt. But it's something that requires direct access to your product, like you know, direct access to be in the control plane, for example. Well, from this perspective, if you have already a, an attacker who has access to the control plane or directly to the, to the OSD, it's like, well, I don't care that there's a vulnerability. I have much bigger problem already. I, I understand. Also, some of these arguments can also be used by people who don't like SE Linux. They can just say, if you already compromised the kernel, well, you're already in there. So it, it's a slippery slope. But let's, uh, yeah. let's start from the product security side, and then I'll tell you the, the product side. Yeah, so what we do, I totally agree, it's hard to fix everything. Not everything is fixable. We don't want to be writing kernel patches. We're not going to be doing that. IBM would like us to, but we'll see. Um, what we do is we're trying to fix everything within SLA that we can, and then fix what we can outside of SLA on a slower time scale. So if Grafana needs to update Golang and they don't fix it within the release cycle, and we're missing SLA, no big deal. We're just going to then have to get it into the next release. But that's how we're fixing it. We're waiting on fixes from upstream products. We're reaching out to upstream. We're saying, hey, your dependency is out of date. Can you fix that? And it is a continual challenge. We're not going to prioritize chasing down, telling upstream vendors to update their versions of Golang over something that we're actually vulnerable to if it's like a Golang exploit that only affects Windows or something. Like, we're not going to chase people down. But we are going to tell them, you might want to up your, we, you might want to bump your Golang. And then when they bump it, and then we have the updated upstream, we just want to be routinely updating products so that we're on the latest versions and so that it's a routine update. Obviously, if there's no upstream patch, asking us to write patches for it is a much bigger ask, and that's, we're supposed to do it, I don't know what's going to happen there. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, thanks. There, is, um, there is a little bit of corporate paradox in terms of the parent organization, IBM, having a policy of fix everything, and the owned, fully owned subsidiary having a policy of we fix what matters. But the part that is interesting, uh, I am personally a fan of Vincent's policy. Just don't tell Big Blue. But, um, the thing is this, um, the customer bases are different. So for Red Hat, it's logical to seek a relationship with customers where you go and you say, trust us, we know what we're doing, you're, we are your partner building the thing that you're building. For IBM, it's sort of a trusted place where don't make me think everything is taken care of for me. So the biggest problem that we are running into, like Sage was saying, is that they run container scanners, oh, we found a vulnerability. A few weeks ago, we were discussing a vulnerability for 20, from 2016. Like, is it really there? Probably not. But the scanner found it, so big emergency. Um, those customers just don't want to think. They just want the scanner not to ever say anything. So there is some sense to the different policies. Um, in the scope of IBM, the SLAs are very different. The things that matter have short-term SLAs. For the other ones, we have very long uh, tail. But Yes, we would like to fix them because it resolves our, our business problems in terms of having fewer escalations. Until Vincent convinces the industry to operate in a different way, crossing fingers, that's, that's where we are. <laughs> and the reality is we have competitors who are writing patches of proprietary versions of this that they then ship to customers. We're, we're dealing with right. that, and that's, that's our competition. So we should all upgrade our dependencies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Sage and Federico. Our time is up for this talk, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you.